Okay, here we go. Folks, well, good evening, everybody. It's good to have you um, out with us this evening. I know people are now just starting to come in, and that's great. I um, want to say welcome to those of you who are with us on Zoom. Always happy that the Zoom uh, group are with us. Um, actually, not long ago, um, I, when uh, Dr. Jennifer was with us, and she was talking about some issues, people were um, re re referring her back to things we had learned in the book of Ephesians. And it was really great <laughs> to see that people are taking the stuff now that we're learning here and are able to go, no, now I understand what those Bible texts were all about. And so for me, this is one of the things I love about Wednesday nights. Um, also, I want to say welcome to those who are with us on Facebook Live. Always happy to have our Facebook family with us. And of course, a little later on in the week, I know there are people who join us on YouTube, and they're catching the YouTube videos. Um, folks, for those of you who are on YouTube, I am working on the recording and sound quality issues. Um, I'm, I'm buying microphones. I'm trying different things. I'm just trying to get that whole sound thing under control. Again, folks, the main study tonight is Acts chapter 7. Again, it's massive, but it's Stephen's sermon is literally a history of the children of Israel. He's going to talk about, you know, Abraham, Joseph, and Moses, and we know those stories. And so we're going to go back to chapter 6, do a little review there, and then I'm going to ask some questions about the well-known Bible stories that we do know. But before we do, uh, as always, just a little introduction. Uh, in 1977, a man by the name of William Dodd actually was a very well-known pastor in London, England. And he was charged with fraud. Um, they found him guilty, and they were going to execute him for fraud. And so while he was in prison, he wrote his last sermon. And uh, they took his sermon they published it and people were reading it and people were like, like, wow, like this is like, um, you know, his best message ever. And um, one person was talking to Dodd's friend, Samuel Johnson, about just how amazing this sermon is. And Dr. Johnson replied, depend upon it. When a man knows he is to be hanged in a fortnight, it concentrates the mind wonderfully. <laughs> nothing, nothing like facing the hangman's rope, you know, to get you focused. Yeah. Um, you know, um, and we could say that about anything that might lead to our death. There's nothing like death to get a person focused. Well, <clears throat> I'm not sure if Stephen knows that he's going to die. Um, he's standing before the very group that did crucify Jesus. Um, but we have in Acts chapter 7 an incredible sermon. I mean, Stephen's focused. He's preaching. He's reviewing um, history. And, and Luke goes into, um, you know, gives great care in, into, again, capturing the details of that message for his Gentile audience. Now, tonight we're going to kind of ask the question, why does Luke um, spend so much time on a sermon about Jewish history? And I want you to keep in mind that this sermon is not a history about Israel. It's a history about God's faithfulness towards Israel and God's people. So while it looks like a, a review of Israel's history, it's really God's history. Um, you know, we call it his story. It's God's story. And certainly God is a part of the journey um, in, in the history and life of the Jews. But really, this is a sermon about God's determination to keep his promise to Adam and Eve and his determination to save humanity through Jesus Christ. And we're going to see who God is and who we are in Stephen's sermon. It's all there. So uh, again, because seven is such a big chapter, we're not going to read all of it. But please go back to chapter six. We're going to read verses 8 through 15, and then we'll pick out a couple of verses from 17. And I think this is still going to work tonight. But before we do, as always, let's start with a word of prayer. Oh, Father God in heaven, Lord, we again thank you so much that we have 
your history as it's recorded in the Bible. And, and I thank you for the things that we learn about who you are. Lord, we know that the mess we're in, this great controversy, is due to the questioning of your character and your faithfulness and just who you are. And now we're going to see a glimpse of that in Stephen's sermon. And as we, again, get into these Bible verses, as we open the word, as we look at the stories again of Abraham and um, Joseph and Moses, we pray that the Holy Spirit in Jesus' name, you'd open the holy word to us. Uh, again, be our teacher and, and show us really who God is. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so again, please take your Bibles. Let's go back to chapter 6, which sets the tone for what happens in chapter 7. And we're going to read verses 8 through 15. And then we're going to pause and, and take a look at um, some of it. Um, now, again, uh, if we have anybody who would be willing to read two verses each, um, that would be greatly appreciated. Again, chapter 6, 8 through 15. Lorian and I can start out. Okay. Uh, verse 8. And Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and miracles among the people. Then these are all certain of the synagogue, which is called the synagogue of Libertines and Cyrenians and Alexandrians, and of them of Sicilia and Asia, disputing with Stephen. And they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spake. Then uh, they uh, suborn, uh, suborn men, which said, We have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. Mm. And they stirred up the people, the elders and the scribes, and they came upon him, seized him, and brought him to the council. They also set up false witnesses who said, this man does not cease to speak blasphemous words against this holy place and the law. For well, we have heard him say <clears throat> that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and change the customs which Moses delivered to us. And all who sat in the council, looking steadfastly at him, saw his face as the face of an angel. Okay, thank you. Let's just stop right there. Now, again, this is what leads up to chapter 7. 7 is just an extension of what we just read. So I wanted to ask, any thoughts, questions, or comments? Again, reflections on this passage. I know we talked about it a little bit last week. Um, just want to see if there was anything else that stood out for you uh, before we go on. Like at the end, it says um, when, when the... Um... When the people, um, well, the, the leaders, I should say, the elders, the scribes, when they heard that, you know, said that he spoke blasphemous words and, and he was going to change the customs. But then it says all who sat in the council, when they looked at him, saw his face as the face of an angel. Well, that's saying something. Mm. And, and that <laughs> determines what your, your thoughts and actions are. What, you know what does an angel's face look like? Yeah. <laughs> oh. <laughs> no, yeah, I see there. Good move, Jay. <laughs> the, the, the folks on Facebook can't see what I'm seeing, but a good move, Jay. <laughs> okay, talking about the face of an angel, and he's he's, he's going for his wife there. Oh, okay, so. Um, okay, so the, the face. Now, um, you know what? It just occurred to me that face of an angel, and mm -hmm. I keep thinking about Nebuchadnezzar, and when he saw a fourth person looking like the son of the gods, you know, yeah. walking around in the fiery furnace, it's kind of yeah. got that feel to it, at least for me. Any other thoughts? And again, for those of you who are on Facebook Live, I am watching the chat here, the chat and Zoom. So if you have any questions or comments, please feel free to share. Go ahead. In verse 8, it says, Stephen, full of faith and power. And in verse 10, 
and they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spake. Mm. And that he spoke boldly. God spoke through him. Uh, yes. I like that. And, and notice the connection between faith, power, and the Holy Spirit. Yes, and then it's interesting how the leaders then, they secretly had men planted in there um, lying about what he was saying, you know. Mm -hmm. Satan always mm -hmm. has somebody right there, you know. And, and you have to, go ahead, Jay. Sorry, yeah, and I'm also looking at the Ellen White uh, Bible, um, and it's got some uh, points in there. It's like they never you know, prepared in advance for the speeches of that day. They they just let the Holy Spirit and God's words flow through them. So uh, mm -hmm. that in itself is amazing. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And good preaching requires the Holy Spirit. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, Placide is writing, those who are disciples of the father of lies will never be able to stand the truth but now you, you, these are uh, for me I, I just picked up on this here we have the sanhedrin and and the pharisees and they understand spiritual things and they're looking at stephen and they their, their response is he looks like an angel like like is this not clue in it's not like he looked like a demon or the devil yeah. I mean, right? Sometimes you look at somebody and they look like the devil, but they're going, he looks like an angel. Okay, so let's 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 tell lies about him. I I where's the disconnect? I, I just don't understand it. Totally Anybody true. else? Okay, I'm, I'm. I'm actually. I'm looking at the time. I'm gonna kind of just move us forward a little here. I, 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 I loved what you shared, and it helps if I click over here. There we go. I wanted to ask: Do you prefer stories that are ba based on fact or fiction? Why or why not? Which do you prefer, folks? I prefer on fact because you have the truth fact that doesn't go wrong okay and why or why not because if it's not on fact fiction fiction isn't real it's it's an uh, an imaginary story <clears throat> and okay. if i can add to that i find people that are not happy with the life they live they want a fiction to escape from the life but the people that are happy with their life, they want more facts to know more about where they are, how the world works and all that. They, they are happy and they are enjoying even more if they are based on facts rather than living in some function, fi functional world, fictional world where they can run wild in their imagination. Mm -hmm. So it's a lot of who likes to read what. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, anybody else? Well, facts are, are true. Yes. I, okay. <laughs> okay. Now I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna spin this a little for you because I happen to have a I I tend to like both and it depends. Now we all get a biography or a true story. It's true. It's facts. Can't go wrong there. Um, when you get into fiction, you can get in, in into fantasy and all sorts of crazy stuff. I get that. But if you have good fiction, there are times we tell truths through allegory, mm -hmm. right? So, for example, parables were fiction, but did Jesus tell great truths through the parables? Yeah. Yes. Right? They were fictional stories, yeah. but they were designed in such a way to communicate a truth. So it doesn't matter if it's a fact or a fiction. The, the question becomes, does it communicate truth? Now, here's the thing. Stephen's sermon isn't um, Stephen's sermon isn't fiction. It's actually based on historical facts. That's right. And so, you know, so he's not telling parables. He's not stretching stories. Um, he's not using allegory to to teach a truth. Right. He actually 
is going for, listen, let me tell you the facts. And so tonight isn't about a parable. Um, it, it isn't like, you know, um, uh, again, like one of Jesus' stories. This is literally, let me tell you about our actual literal history. Placide's writing, when it comes to spiritual truths, we need facts. Mm -hmm. uh, when we want to bring context, fiction can be a good channel to do so. Mm -hmm. So uh, fact can relate experience and as a testimony to your life. So there are times when um, in, in preaching, um, I'll give the Bible text. This is the truth. And then sometimes I'll have a story or an illustration to um, expound on the point. And so as long as you're dealing in truth or it's, you know, about communicating the truth, that's the important thing. Mm -hmm. Now, I wanted to ask this question. Um, there we go. When was the last time you heard a story? Uh, that made you so mad you wanted to kill somebody for telling it. Never. <laughs> Have you ever heard a story that made you mad? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, when someone else is being mistreated. Yeah. And the person know better. Right. Um, that's not a story. Actually, that's facts. Okay. Um, okay, um, Angela, we're actually, we started in chapter 6, verses 8 through 15, and we're going to be talking about chapter 7 tonight, and uh, so we're kind of in between what the book? I haven't been chapters. here for a while. What Acts, book? sorry. Oh, okay. Acts. Thank you. Yeah, it's the book of Acts. Okay, so um, I got a couple of comments uh, happening here. Um, Eunice is saying, when we don't have the Holy Spirit, we are blind to even obvious facts. Mm. And that is why it's important to have the seal of God, because otherwise we will be deceived. Um, <laughs> no, no, I like Tamara's answer. Uh, if it's a false story about me, you ever feel like killing somebody because they were gossiping about you? You get angry, right? And you're just like, no, folks, we're, we're, we're not, you know, I, let's, let's be real here. There are times when we'll hear a story and it makes us mad, maybe because the story is telling a lie. Maybe it's because they're lying about you. Sarah, you have your hand up. Yeah, I was just going to talk about the question you had here. Um, but I have felt I have felt this way. When was the last time you heard a story that made you so mad you wanted to kill somebody for telling it? I actually wanted to shoot them. And mm -hmm. I'll be honest. You know, I literally, I said to God, if I had a gun, I would shoot them in their mouth. <laughs> <laughs> Carolyn, it's good to be honest on the front because that's how God can work with you. And right. God, and God healed me of that. I, I had the feeling for a while that I tell you, if I if I did have a gun at that time, I would have used it in the mouth, one shoot in the mouth. So yes, I was blessed. And and at the same time, I was still growing in my Christian growth. So mm -hmm. I'm just being realistic about the question you're asking here. And I'm just being very, um, um, maybe vulnerable, but it was in the past. And I thank God that I never got to take to carry out the act. Amen. But, but, I, but I believe that, um, I believe that what the question being asked is what happened with Stephen and, and the Jews when he spoke the truth, that they literally killed him for it. Mm -hmm. yeah. you know, that's what I'm thinking. Mm -hmm. and, well, and that's the context of the, the question, yeah. because let's face it, there are times you'll hear something and you're infuriated and you feel like you might want to kill the other person, right? That's hum That's being human. There's a difference, though, between I'm so angry, I feel it versus I'm angry enough to act on it. And one of the things, uh, you know, um, uh, you know, down through the ages, I mean, Martin Luther got up to speak the truth and they wanted to kill him for it. The mm -hmm. martyrs got up and they spoke the truth and they killed them for it. Mm -hmm. um, there are times now when we live in an age where if you don't agree with somebody's narrative, people mm -hmm. are becoming violent and angry if you don't agree with my worldview. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it's one thing to recognize your humanity and say, boy, that really angered me. Or you heard a story about injustice and it angered you on behalf of the victims. Yeah. Stories 
can evoke emotions and very strong and powerful ones. Some stories might make you cry. Some might make you praise the Lord. Some others might make you feel like you want to pick up a gun. Mm. And some of them might be, I'm just offended. And, 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 and how dare you, you know, um, tell, you know, tell me I'm living a lie. How dare you disagree with me? Mm. So again, Stories can evoke strong feelings. What you're responsible for is checking the feelings, submitting them to God, and then using those emotions to do something, you know, positive, do something powerful with it. Mm -hmm. The Bible says you can get angry, just don't mm -hmm. sin. So don't shoot anybody the next time you hear a story. You don't. <laughs> but, but connect. Go ahead, Carolyn. Mm -hmm. Carolyn and then Sarah? Oh, I was just saying, uh, thank heaven she didn't have a gun. Um, but some of the news stories, you know, that you hear, mm -hmm. like just uh, the news stories uh, tonight, I heard of uh, of these boys that were, uh, well, they're adult boys, but they were shot at and, and not, fortunately not killed. But the mothers were interviewed. This was in Vermont. And it's all because of this Mideast crisis. You know, somebody that was, uh, you know, shooting just because of, of, of the nationality. You mm -hmm. know? That is sad. And, and that, is, that is really infuriating. And then, and then the hostages that are, that are basically babies and seven months old. I, I mean, you know, mankind is really, we've, you know, deteriorated so greatly. Yes. It just yeah. shows that uh, the second coming is sooner than we think. Oh, it is mm -hmm. so very soon. Amen. So very soon. Yeah. Sarah, I thank you. To, I just wanted to share a little, a little I, I summarize it into two two minutes, but I've got a brother who um is so wrapped up in the Lord and in church now and that God saved him from destruction. He was on his way um, to the States. He had, he had his, his, his well, she, they were going to get married and she went to the States and she got involved with somebody else. And when he found out, he was literally on his way to the States in the aeroplane when God, Holy Spirit touched his heart and said to him, it's not worth your salvation. I've got better in store mm -hmm. for you. And my brother was literally intent on going there to finish her off. But when God spoke to him and captured his heart up in the air in an airplane, he came back home. He was a totally changed person and he has been so wrapped up in the church since then. And mm -hmm. in addition to that, God gave him a beautiful, wonderful Christian girl and they've got a lovely son and he has forever been in the church and drawing closer and closer to God. So I, I just wanted to share this to say, thank God for the power of his mm -hmm. Holy Spirit. Thank God for the power of his blood. Thank God for his crucifixion. Thank God Amen. for saving us, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, okay. Um, Placid, you made a comment here in the chat. I'm going to read it. And then I want you to hold on to that thought. And that is Stephen's story shows that spiritually insecure leaders can be a danger to unity in the church. Very powerful statement. Let's hold on to that. I want to move yeah. us along here. Um, back in chapter six, Stephen was accused of blasphemy against Moses, blasphemy against God, uh, speaking against the temple and the law, uh, or that he claimed that Jesus would alter the customs given by Moses. Yeah, I believe it's all. All of them. Yeah. He was all accused of all. all of this. Yeah. Right? Now, here's the yes. thing. They had to bring in people to lie about him to make these yeah. accusations. Mm -hmm. um, um, so, so, so here they are. They're bringing in people to lie about him. And, and I'm reading what Eunice is saying here. She says, can you imagine how God feels about all the lies? that were and are told about him, mm. right? So mm. here they are. They're, they're falsely accusing Stephen because Stephen didn't actually put it this way. He didn't actually preach what he did this way. Mm. Um, and so here they are. They're bringing in people to lie about him. And Stephen, before he speaks, get this, before he speaks, 
he lights up. Um, so uh, take a look at this. Could, uh, it's verse 15, and fixing their gaze on him, all who were sitting in the council saw his face mm -hmm. like the face of an angel. Yeah. And I want to ask, what do you imagine the face of an angel might look like? I heard Albert actually ask this a little earlier. <laughs> it is, well, it is, we know it is with light, bright light. It, when when Moses was in the mount and coming mm -hmm. down, mm -hmm. his face was so bright that mm -hmm. he, he had to cover his face. Mm -hmm. So I think when you're, because an angel from heaven, he's coming from the presence of God. Yes. His face, uh, it's, mm -hmm. it's lighted up. Yes. Mm -hmm. And when you are, your face like an angel, you're filled with joy and confidence and trust in your great creator mm -hmm. if yeah. i can add um i've heard some testimonies actually in china where they're so heavily persecuted for speaking the christian faith that uh, they were saying that they would meet in very uh, uh, secret locations and they would change locations to be able mm -hmm. to talk and uh, some of our North American people were there to, to try to snuggle Bibles, to talk to them, and said that some of the people that were speaking there, they met in some restaurant, they kind of got the people through the back, they were Christian Christians, and he said, we actually saw people that their faces were glowing, mm. so happy. They, you would see that someone that dedicated their life to, to God how they live and how they look like. The first time when I read that uh, <clears throat> verse actually, where it said that uh, it had been the face of an angel, which we know that means messenger. So I was like, if they knew what the angel meant and that he is like a messenger, wouldn't they believe in the message that he's actually bringing and <clears throat> more truth and more try to understand what he was actually saying, not just to go after and listen to the accusers without actually seeing the way he lined up the truth. Because mm -hmm. if they didn't understand his message, they wouldn't um, go towards him in the same way. Okay, absolutely. Okay, so I, I wanted to ask this question. If you were put on trial and you had to pick two topics upon which to speak, what would they be? Uh, the messages received through Ellen White, 1844 and the pre-advent judgment, the assurance of salvation, the health message, the second coming, or maybe you've got something else. If you could preach, you know, Stephen picked three topics. I'm giving you two. Which two would you choose? The, the assurance of salvation and, and the second coming. Yeah. Yes, that's mine too. I take C and E. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so I'm 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 here. Jay, did you say B and E? C and E. C and E. Okay. Yeah. Carolyn, what did you say? C and E. The uh, salvation and the second coming. Okay. Uh, anybody else? C and I would e. I I have personal e. testimonies to speak. Okay. God has done for for me and my family. Mm hmm. Okay. Uh, okay. I, I I I love it. For some people, it might have been the three angels' message. Um, Eunice is saying Jesus or Jesus only. Um, uh, here's the thing: we have a lot of great things we can speak on. Yeah. Stephen's choosing three or or four. Um, I just you know wanted to ask if you had the opportunity, what would you choose? And um, you know, of course, the assurance of salvation, the second coming of Christ. Um, but also, I think it also depends on context, right? Because the health message can be a really good message. Yes. Um, right? So, or, or maybe there's a time when, you know, uh, you, you need to hear about the pre-advent judgment. But by and large, uh, most people, when I ask this question, go with C and E. Um, but Jesus only, and, and so, I, I, again, whatever the Holy Spirit moves you to speak on, that's what you speak on. Amen. Amen. Sarah, you have your hand up. I am just about this. I'm just thinking that we will be given an opportunity to speak. The time is going to come when we will be given an opportunity to speak. And God will, his Holy Spirit, 
we'll put in our hearts what to speak and what we speak because God Holy Spirit has put it in our hearts we are told it will bring conviction to the hearers and some will accept mm -hmm. Jesus Christ okay now okay great um so now we have the story of Abraham is told and I know you know the story of Abraham, you know the story of Moses, and you know the story of Joseph. And I wanted to ask in each case, think about this and um, you know, quickly, you know, share. Um, what is your favorite part of the story of Abraham? When the Lord told him he's gonna have a son, and he believed it, and the scripture says that was counted for righteousness for him. Mm. Okay. I think well for some others. What did you like about the story of Abraham? My my I what I like about the story is is relentless faith that he never wavered, you know, despite everything that was going on and he had to wait for so long for his son Isaac. He still didn't waver and when God asked him to sacrifice his only son. He just mm. went ahead and did it. So his faith is relentless faith. And 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 Angela, I, I like that because even though he had moments where he 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 failed in faith, his mm. faith never failed on the promise of God. Amen. Amen. You know, uh, and I like that. Um, when the Lord said, uh, "Stop and showed him the lamb," uh, for Eunice. Um, for Placid, it's the purity of his heart. I like the part where um, he did, when he did not tell Sarah, when he had to go sacrifice Abraham, Isaac. That's right. That's he, he, yeah, I like that. I like the fact that he, 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 he was wise, yeah. he was sensible. And I like the fact that he knew when not to trust his wife with what God had told him to do. Mm -hmm. But the first rounds when he trusted her with what God told him to do, she made him do wrong by sending Hagar in to him and he listened to her. So he learned from his mistake. So I like that part when he took a when he took Isaac and didn't tell Sarah anything at all, but simply went about how what God told him to do. And, and I like that. And, and added to that, Sarah, I, I wonder, and I know the Bible doesn't say this. But maybe somewhere in his heart, he thought, no, I'm coming back with the boy. Why upset her unnecessarily? You know, I, I wonder if that maybe was some of that thinking, I don't, I can't prove it. I just wonder. Mm. Okay. Um, so, so what, what I liked in the, in the story of, of Abraham was when he met Melchizedek mm. and the respect he had for a servant of God that like, like, Abraham was like, here's somebody who gets God on my level, and we're instant friends, right? And 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 I loved his generosity. Um, you know, with all that wealth, none of it was for him. So part of that wealth is for God. The rest is for those in need. And I'm just going to connect with God, with, with, you know, this man who loves God the way I love God. Um, that's what I loved in his story. Now, I wanted to ask then, uh, what is your favorite part of the story of Moses? <laughs> my favorite part is oh. when he went up in the mount and he spent all that time up in the mount with god mm. the part okay. that I like about my favorite or one of my favorite parts about the story of moses is that when he when the people got him angry and he struck the rock and god said to him after that because of that you will not um, go into the promised land mm -hmm. his love and his trust in God did not waver he still loved God he still, Amen. still mm -hmm. trusted God and God gave him something better and I, I like the part when he told God if you're going to destroy them destroy me also I, I really do like those it shows he was so selfless mm -hmm. love for his people yes yeah absolutely Placide you had your hand up no, I'm mad at Sister Sarah because she was supposed to say only one and then she took mine. <laughs> <laughs> so what Sarah said. <laughs> yeah, the fact that uh, he, because God uh, wanted to to 
destroy the entire people and use mm. his to create a new people for himself and he, he declined. Yeah. Would we do mm. the same today? I hear you. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, given how much they, they they how much stress they gave Moses. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Angela. I was about to say what Placid say, but I'm gonna put a nice word in it. He was a great negotiator because he mm. negotiated with God for the salvation of those people, despite the people's stubbornness. He mm. never, never gave up negotiating. He's a great negotiator. Are we mm. willing to negotiate like that for our brothers and sisters when it comes down to God? Are we willing yeah, to do that? You know? When our, hearts, <laughs> when, when our hearts uh, are knitted uh, uh, to, to God like Moses was, we will be, Angela. Well, and think about it. This is what intercessory prayer is all about. Amen. This is what makes Moses a type of Christ intercession. Amen. Right? Will yeah. need to sacrifice himself for the salvation of others. Yeah. Um, Eunice is saying, and I, I, I here we go. I admire his patience with that people and the reverence towards the name of God. Amen. I, I, I like the part where Moses one day wanted to see God's face. I, I would be, I so relate to that. I so relate to that desire, God. I just want to see your face. Yeah. Um, wow. Not, 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 not to bolster his faith, but like I'm, I'm so in love with you. Like I, 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 I just want to see yes. who you are. Yeah. You know. Okay. The next one in the story, um, that of Joseph. What's your favorite part of the story of Joseph? His forgiveness of his brothers. He said yes. With all the plan that God had so that we could all live mm-hmm. yeah. he had his forgiveness was just like christ's forgiveness yes yes, yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. My, my favorite i just read it last night he was a dreamer <laughs> <laughs> no he's not only dream but he was able to interpret afterwards his he realized he, what his dream was after he became governor over mm-hmm. Egypt but then he interpreted the dream for the butler but he never said the interpretation interpretation came from him he said doesn't God when he when he saw them and said why are you so sad he said doesn't God God interpret dreams he never said it was him I like that about him it was very humble mm-hmm okay uh, I see Boriana then Sarah. Yeah, for me, it's, uh, he's trusting God, even in the jail, wherever he was. Mm. He went through so much being betrayed by family. That's the worst thing that you can go through. Your own blood yeah. you know, tried to kill you. The, everything he went through, he still trusted in God, even in jail. And wherever he went, he was patient. He knew that God is with him. Doesn't matter where he is. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and I, Sarah? I like I like the fact that um when he had those dreams, he didn't he knew he didn't just he was not making the making it up in his mind. Yeah. He knew that the dream was from God because Amen. Joseph had a relationship with God as from a small boy. And and even though he was spoiled, for want of a better word. It did not take away the fact that he loved God and he was not boastful about that love in a boastful mm. way. I, I like that about him. So that I, I, even as a dreamer, he wasn't a, stay, a, a stargazer dreaming foolish, but he knew that the dreams that he had gotten from God were more so like visions from God. Yeah, He didn't understand everything at that time until later on, but he never boasted about it at all. Mm. Um, he's I, also I have... sorry go ahead. go ahead a resistor of the devil <gasps> when mm. yeah. his wife came <laughs> yep yeah. uh, I, I have two comments in chats uh, over on Facebook uh, okay. we have Eunice who said 
he remained faithful and it never went to his head. Mm. And and Placid goes uh, how he saw God's hands at work in every phase of his life. Mm. He knew who his God was. His tribulations were part of God's plan for his life. And, you know, for him to be able to see God's big picture um, at the end and go, I get it all. Now, 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 you know, hindsight is twenty twenty, but he was able to see God's hand in everything. Yeah. And, and so the reason I'm asking this question is because his audience would have been listening to these stories and they would have enjoyed the stories. There was something in these stories all of them would have liked. So his audience would have been with him because these are good stories, right? <laughs> I wanted to ask you, um, was uh, what part of their stories did you not like? Just pick one and say, was there anything in any of their stories you go, yeah, I'm, I don't know. I don't think I like that. I didn't like when Abraham succumbed to Sarah's um um, telling him to go take it. I, I just didn't, we could elaborate, but I just say, I just didn't mm -hmm. like when he did that. Well, okay. I, I thought of that and he should have stood up and, yes. and, yes. and, and uh, says, God, tell them that they're going to have a son and therefore, yes. no. But he was too easily persuaded there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, well, I, I, I wouldn't have said he was easily for years and years waiting and your wife is nagging you every night. You know, it's kind of like... No, I'm not making any excuse for him. Sorry. No, I'm, I'm not making excuses, <laughs> but I'm just trying to be realistic. She's yeah. nagging you every night, right? And mm -hmm. <laughs> so, I mean, it's just a reality. But, you know, he probably just gave in and said, oh, that's enough. You know, I just want to get you off my back. Reality. Okay. I don't okay, think so. he was thinking that. I don't think so either. <laughs> okay. So, I, so that I, there's the word on Abraham. Okay. I didn't <laughs> how, like how the, the other way, stories. I didn't like the way Joseph's brothers uh, treated him. I know mm. he was favor uh, favorite, but not with what they did to him. You know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, tried. that was jealousy. Yeah. It's crazy. Yeah. And, and and that all like Abraham lying about his you know wife being his sister, uh, uh, you know them uh, lying to their father about uh, the son. Uh, it all goes back to that you know the deceit of Satan, right? Yeah. Um, I I really did not like like uh, on Sunday uh, morning we had our men's ministry uh, and we watched a, an amazing video um, where you know what it means to be a man. And, and a man will protect um, his wife and his kids, and yeah. in that instance, um, failed. Yeah. Uh, and and you know he didn't trust in God. Um, you know, yeah. Okay. Um, so so in every story, what we see is they're not perfect people, but they all have a God story. Yeah. And yes. in the end. They, these imperfect people still had a relationship with a really great God. Yeah. And, and I want to kind of just transition into this question here, because now he's in their stories. We find the story of Israel, but in their stories, we also have the story of God because God is in all of these stories. Mm -hmm. They don't exist without God. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to ask this question. What does Israel's history tell us? about god it tells me that <laughs> it tells okay, okay, me yeah. that the lord is very involved in our life and even mm. sometimes we're not aware of it but he is and he said we're like the apple of his eye which means nothing touches you without touching him yes mm. amen also Amen. Tells, it also tells me, in addition to what Doreen has just shared, that we serve a God who is beyond compare where love is concerned for his children. Mm -hmm. And that he would stop at nothing to save us to come live with him throughout eternity. Oh, mm -hmm. praise God. Amen. Amen. Now, Carolyn, you were saying something. I didn't quite hear it. And then we'll go to Angela. 
you'll know it. God is determined to save each one of us. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Um, Angela, and then I'm going to go to Eunice's comment. Yeah, yeah. Well, it shows God's unconditional love for yes. humankind. Mm. And it also shows his mercy is everlasting. Mm -hmm. Yes. Amen. Amen. Um, Eunice is saying exactly. But that is what gives me hope because even though they failed, God did not give up on them or me. Yeah. Um, four things that, that I was thinking about. One, God always keeps his promises. You know, the story of the Old Testament is God keeping his promise to Adam and Eve. Mm -hmm. And then through these individuals, you know, God is keeping his promise to Adam and Eve. He needs a family through yeah. which Messiah can be born. That's yeah. Abraham. Right. Um, the, the, the world is threatened by a famine. God needs to keep his people alive. So he's got um, Joseph. Um, right. Um, and so then uh, his people need to be delivered and set free and they need to know about God's law, the tabernacle and all of that. God always keeps his promise. God always keeps his side of a covenant. Oh, Did he ever fail Abraham? No. God is always sovereign and is always in control. And that God always tried to communicate his will to his people. And I've got to add, God is determined to save us because how could I miss that? Um, <laughs> absolutely. Now, I, I want to ask in turn, what does Israel's history tell us about God's people or maybe even us today? Exactly what I was about to say. It's just what we are even worse because we have their example of how they just totally showed God utter hoarding. And we are still doing the same today because we have not learned from their lesson. And, and when I think about, I mean, I think about our, what we are doing it, it, and how it makes God so sad, but, but yet God, God's grace is, is, oh, I, I just can't find the word to describe it. It's, it's just, it's, it's just, mm -hmm. I can't find the word to describe it. Okay, and Angela's saying stubborn people. <laughs> yep. We uh, forget so quickly what, what God has done for us in our we, own personal life. We do. Mm. Yeah. We do. We do. Um, Tamara yeah. and on Facebook is writing, people are generally hard to put up with. Now, folks, here, here's what, uh, I, I, my thoughts on this are, and you're capturing them. Mm -hmm. Everything God, what I see, everything God is in these stories, his people are not. Mm -hmm. you look at the history yeah. of Israel. Mm -hmm. When you think about it, they never kept a promise. They always broke their side of a deal. Mm -hmm. They always rejected God's messengers, and they were never in control of their circumstances. Mm -hmm. Right? I, I mean, you know, um, you you think about the promises and 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 they make this deal with God and and no sooner have they made a deal with God than they turn around and it's the golden calf, yeah, yeah. or they're worshiping Baal or Ostroth. Yeah. Um, look, look at look at how they treated God's messengers. I mean, Joseph was a messenger, and look at how he got treated. Mm -hmm. Moses, David, Samuel, Elijah, Jeremiah, Isaiah. Mm -hmm. Like, did they hang Isaiah upside down and cut him with a saw? Mm -hmm. Like, like they they were always rejecting God's messengers and they were never in control, right? I mean, take Egypt, the Assyrians, the Babylonians, the, the, the Philistines were all proof of without God, mm. they were not in control, right? They were always under the protection. And, and so what the history of Israel tells me is that no matter how God, how God tries, we are so, so often not like our heavenly father, even though, uh, you know, you look at all of this, and then you add to this, he's faithful, he's determined to save them, he's merciful, he's gracious, and, and he's always trying to draw them to himself. Yes. Right? Right. Now, um, oh, why did how'd that get in there? Okay. Um, so which of God's prophets did they persecute the most? Moses, Samuel. Jeremiah, Daniel, Isaiah, or Ellen White? All. Moses, Samuel, Jeremiah, yeah. 
Daniel, Isaiah. All, I will say all of them. Even Sister White, yes. <laughs> well, yes, because even today people are talking, people saying she, 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 she committed plagiarism and all kinds of foolishness. And no. she's not from God. That that's that's um that's persecution in a way in one way or another. And um even from within the church, people are you know de desecrating what God has given her to help us to, to fit us to prepare us for His kingdom. So yeah. Amen. Yeah. Right. Um, usually, and that's why. Go ahead. Yes. I was gonna say usually when people have negative comments mm -hmm. regarding any of God's prophet mm -hmm. it's because they are not reading and especially ellen white they are not reading what she has written because there is no way you if you read the book desire of ages steps to christ christ object lesson ministry of healing mount of blessing testimonies to the church and and so much more if they are not reading it, they are not getting spiritually enriched because mm -hmm. it is an enrichment to our spirituality. Right. Actually, no, Doreen said something, and I'm going to say that this is a solid proof. She sent me this video, or it was Deborah. It's about light. You turn off your lights at nine o'clock, you go to your bed, you get up early. And I actually did that the other day. There are days when I'm feeling a little bit down, sort of like a depressive mood. And I did that the other day and it worked. It worked. Who tell who, who say that to anyone? Nobody found that out. She was the only one who came up with that mm -hmm. in her ministry of healing. And I'm I telling so. you all, try that. Turn mm -hmm. off everything, go to your bed at nine o'clock, get up in the morning, Go outside, you will see there's a difference in your life. No, seriously. Yes, mm -hmm. I agree. Right? Yeah, I agree with that. Yeah, she had access to information beyond her time. Now, yes. the reason I threw her name in is, and and now Eunice was, was was actually my vote would have been Jeremiah. Same with Eunice, just because of everything they put him through. But here's the point: it doesn't matter the prophet or what age they are in, even including today. Um, and it doesn't have to be a prophet. Um, you know, um, it, it comes down to when you're a messenger of God, yes. you're going to meet resistance. Oh, yes. Yes. Right? You you just, and, and and so we see this even in modern times, like, like Sarah was saying, we are no different today mm -hmm. in a lot of ways than they were. Mm -hmm. So I um, want to move us along here. Um why did Stephen bring up Moses, the law, and the prophets? Why do you think he did that? Because the people of Israel, they, 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 they have respect to Moses, um, the law, and the prophets. They do. They they may not necessarily be obedient to what was presented by Moses all the time. They gave him a hard time as he he's patiently and mercifully leading them to the promised land. But, okay. um, yeah. I think he wanted to remind them of something that they knew and how they felt about Moses and they they, 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 they kept the law to a T, at least so they say, you know. Yes. Mm -hmm. and, and so he wanted to remind them that all of this, Moses, the law and the prophets, all of this comes from the Jesus Christ, the one that they don't want to accept. So I, I think that's why he brought up Moses, the law and the prophets. Okay. Well, now, you know, because Moses was a witness to, was a witness to all of all of this okay. right okay I, I i like this hang on to that eunice is saying his audience was jews so they would relate to this think about what he was being charged with he's being charged with blaspheming against moses blaspheming against the law and and that he was trying to argue that um that he was trying to do it with the law and the prophets and here's stephen's argument you've had the law the prophets and moses all along and how did you treat them 
Yeah. And, then when, and then when the one all of them pointed to came, how did you treat him? And you're accusing me of blasphemy? Are you kidding me? Yeah. So he's trying to yeah. enlighten the high priest and the leaders. Yeah. Enlighten. Yeah. So do you, do you catch his argument? We have a history. We have a history of disrespecting Moses, the law, and the prophets. Yeah. And with the one when the one they all pointed to came, you treated him no differently than you treated Moses, than you treated David or yeah. Jeremiah or any other prophet. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And yet you accuse me of the very things our nation and you yourselves are guilty of. Yes. This time you blasphemed against God. Mm -hmm. You sinned against God. You crucified and you killed God. Mm -hmm. And 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 if so, if you're accusing me of blaspheming against Moses, dude, you're guilty of blaspheming against God, mm -hmm. the God Moses worshipped. Yeah. So his argument is is actually, um, is you know kind of brilliant. So now he he also deals with what that is that they truly love, and 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 I wanted to ask where did the Pharisees place most of their focus on laws and traditions, buildings and locations, on God Himself? on their own righteousness number four number one. Oh, one one and one. four i would say okay one and four some are saying four i would argue it's one two and four mm. they were focused on everything and anything but god okay and, and that was stephen's point you love your laws and your traditions you love the temple you love your own righteousness, but you didn't love the one to whom, again, all of this was supposed to be about. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to, uh, so look at this. Uh, However, the Most High does not dwell in houses made by human hands, as the prophet says. So you can be in love with your temple. You can be in love with your buildings. You can be in love with your, but so I wanted to ask, in what ways might we be putting too much emphasis, let's say, on holy buildings? You may not relate to this at first, but let's see. Jesus says anything you put above him, anything, it's what becomes your God. So mm -hmm. we have to be so careful who always is first in our lives. As much yeah. as we want to have a nice temple for the Lord or a nice home that God, Holy Spirit dwells in, or we admire God's beauty, if any time those things takes up more of our time than our, our than us spending time with God. And we can walk and talk with God all day when we're doing our work, when we're watching our work. Anytime anything supersedes spending or giving God our best, our most, it becomes our God. Mm. One of the reasons why I, I, I brought this one up and brought it forward is because there are times when people um, will place a greater emphasis um, on keeping buildings than trying to save people. Mm, yeah. We have a mission. Our mission is to, you know, um, it, it's to grow God's kingdom. Jesus said, go out and make disciples, yeah. right? They had made room for some 12,000 worshipers. And yet I've been, I've been in, I've been to places where the attitude was, well, you know what? Uh, we would rather send people somewhere else than sell the building. And then they wondered why nobody was filling the building. Mm. God's mission has to come before a building. Yes. The mission doesn't get modified for the building. The building modifies for the mission. And, and, and the temple and all the ceremonial laws and, and all their traditions had to give way to God's determination to save people. And they weren't willing to let any of it go, so much so they were willing to kill Jesus yeah. than to give up everything it pointed to. Yeah. And so when we put the building ahead of our mission and God's determination to save people and add to God's family, then we've put too much emphasis on the building. Yeah. The salvation of souls, have to, it, that, that's God's work. Yes. And it has to come first. Yes. So, um, what did Stephen say was the true source of our holiness? 
Or what would you say is the true source of our holiness, folks? God is holy, so our true source of holiness is from God. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And Stephen's looking at them and going, your temple doesn't make you holy. Moses and the law and the prophets don't make you holy. All your traditions don't make you holy, therefore you're not holy. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. So so Stephen's saying a lot of things. He just laid down the hammer. Um, so what turned the people against Stephen? And I mean the court. Claiming their ancestors murdered the prophets. The accusation they had killed the Messiah. Inflammatory terms like your heathen hearts. Um, bringing Jesus into the story. Or Stephen's statement that he could see into heaven. I think all of them. Remember when I asked, have you ever heard a story that made you so angry you were willing to kill? Mm -hmm. This was the story. Yeah. Your ancestor was murdered. You killed the Messiah. You have yeah. heathen hearts, not sanctified hearts. Um, Jesus is the Messiah. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, imagine being able to see into heaven. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm going to skip over that one. What was the central message to Stephen's sermon? That they when... needed their hearts to God. They had not given their hearts to God. And that was what he was trying to tell them. Mm. He actually wasn't trying, he was telling them that they, that they were outside of God still, that they had not surrendered their lives to God. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> Also, he, he, he shared that, um, reminded them that Christ was the Messiah, the true Messiah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Amen. Amen. And uh, Eunice is saying, repent. And it all comes down to this. Jesus is the Son of God. Amen. And the only means by which we really are saved. Absolutely. This is central, mm -hmm. right? They crucified the Son of God. Mm -hmm. um, but in doing so, they were doing God's work because God sent Jesus to save us. Mm -hmm. Amen. So, so I, I want I, I, this last passage, the last two verses, um, 59 and 60, really moved me. And, and, and it reads, they went on stoning Stephen as he called on the Lord and said, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then falling on his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. Mm. Having said this, he fell asleep. Mm. I wanted to ask what comes to mind when you hear those words. Jesus on the cross. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Jesus. The crucifixion. The crucifixion. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. The words of Jesus himself. Yeah. He, he even in his own death, mm -hmm. Stephen was still determined like Jesus, mm -hmm. to see these people saved. Mm -hmm. yes. Can you imagine your heart? These people are trying to murder you, and you're trying to see them saved while they're murdering you. Mm -hmm. This is the cross, and this was Stephen, and this was the martyrs. It's not about my life, not about my traditions, not about my preferences. Mm -hmm. It's ultimately about the salvation. Mm -hmm of those around us. So as a final thought, a truth worth sharing, Stephen's sermon reminds us that God has proven time and again that he is determined to save us, no matter how hard-hearted or rebellious we might be. God's grace is Amen. unlimited. Amen. Folks, that was our study for tonight. Uh, a great, a lot of great feedback, a lot of, a lot of, great uh, interaction there thank you all so much now again um as always uh we like to close out with prayer requests and i'm just gonna grab a pen here and write them down for any prayer requests yeah i do have one yes my mother <laughs> she's experiencing some paranoia she doesn't want to open her window. She doesn't want to go outside. I went to see her today. She's so afraid. She'll wear a mask. Uh, 
it's one of the most challenging things that I ever have to deal with with her because she's just mm. anxiety is really killing her. And no matter what I would say to her, it doesn't matter. I'm like, it's okay. Nobody's watching you. No one is looking at you. You can't. Oh, it's just, that's a really tough one. And then she'll tell you there's nothing wrong with her head, with my head. Somebody is mm -hmm. watching me, but something is definitely wrong. Anyways. Yeah, it's it's tough to watch what happens to our loved yeah. ones when they age, right? Yeah, yeah. And now, and then my father, I need prayer. Mm. I'm going to see him in about a week or so. I'm going to Jamaica. So I need you guys to pray for me that we'll have a safe travel. Mm -hmm. and, uh, my father, too, is sick. He's in a nursing home. So okay. he's 94. And I haven't seen him for a while. So this is going to be a highlight of the trip. So for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. He'll be happy to see you, Angela. I don't for even sure. recognize me. That's the thing. Oh, yeah, yeah. that's a possibility. Yeah. So, but but you might be surprised. But hopefully you oh, will yeah. be surprised. I know. Hopefully you will be surprised. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mm. Folks, uh, anybody else? Yes. Please remember Louise Matthews' family. The funeral is tomorrow at Benjamin. So remember uh, Roger and her children and grandchildren. Okay. One of the ladies, I think it was Francesca, put on the ladies' chat a couple of days ago. Yesterday it was that there's a young boy. Um, he had four heart attacks um, yesterday, and she's asked us to just send it out to everybody who we know will pray to pray for him. His name is um, um, Bruno Molina. So, yeah. Let's pray for Bruno. The little one, a little one, I, th I think he's about eight if wow. that much. In, I don't think he's that old either. He's younger than that, but he's in the hospital. And um, so we can pray mm -hmm. for Bruno Molina. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and Angela, I don't know that you can see this, but you have a word of encouragement from Eunice. Oh, and she's okay. saying in relation to your dad, but you know him, Angela, and that's what matters. That's important. Yeah. Folks, anybody else? I, I want to praise Sorry. God. Go ahead. Sorry. Uh, praise for all those miners that were rescued from the mine. I think oh, wonderful. 41. Yes. 41 of them. Yes. Wow, another one like that? Oh, my goodness. Wow, wow. 41. Praise the Lord. That's a lot. Wow. Okay, I hadn't heard about this. I'm going to have to look it up. They were in India. Um, yes. Oh, okay. I'd like to pray for the truth, just the truth, you know, and, and because this world is full of um, gray lies, lies um, the half truths, um, whether it be politicians or people who still go out there and, um, you know, uh, just the truth. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I, I have to praise God for an amazing, exhausting, but amazing weekend. Um, I got to share um, down at uh, New Beginnings and uh, Bethel Churches came together for a, for a weekend. And um, I, I tell you, it was a very different experience. Um, being able to preach at an all black church and, and just the energy that comes from that cultural group and um, just praising God for being able to talk about evangelism and how to evangelize the community. And uh, we were having some really great conversations. Yeah. And then the men's, the men's prayer breakfast, I, I have to admit, the conversation was just like, wow, next level, just honest man to man. Sharing our hearts about being fathers and husbands, um, it it just there was a the spirit of humility and um, just sincerity. Um, we had a really great turnout, um, and I'm just praising God for what He's doing in and among His people. 
Amen. And, um, you know, and as we come up to the Christmas season, people will be in need. And we pray that God will watch over them as well. Amen. And uh, that we'll have the ability um, to um, to help those in need this Christmas. I'd also like to pray for the women's ministry um, coming up. Yeah. On December 3rd, too. Uh, they are having their breakfast. Yes. Pastor, where is it Bethel and and what and living what living temple? What, where were these churches? They're down in Etobicoke. Oh, in Etobicoke. Okay, okay. Yeah, and I guess Bethel's been there for fifty years, and um, they, they, I saw the list of pastors who went through, and um, you know, good people, mm -hmm. sincere. I mean, they want to make a difference, mm -hmm. and. Uh, um, you know, I did a workshop with them. I haven't been able to do with Nepean yet, but, it, you know, strategies for reaching the world. And I tell you, um, and then I did the, I actually preached the message where uh, you might remember it where I, I took a book and I dropped it on a pop can, the 2080 rule. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and I tell you, um, and, and, but, but then I showed using more pop cans, how it can hold a greater load. And I was building a tower with pop cans and cinder blocks. Mm -hmm. And when I dropped the cinder block on the empty pop can, like six people immediately jumped out of their pews, <laughs> like like in, in reaction to truth that is such truth. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and um, it's just it's it's you know I praise God that you know we can speak into people's situations, mm -hmm. and it's it's praising God for you know again, and then oh the Pathfinder concert i'm told was amazing uh, I, i'm told that that was just like wow what a concert they raised a thousand dollars uh for the club in their fundraising effort um you know so just again praising god for just how good he is and uh yeah. um just again all the people who whether you're doing hamper programs or you're giving out um literature you know god's people want to make a difference and I'm praising God for that. Amen. Let's close folks with a word of prayer. Let's pray. Well, Father God in heaven, Lord, we are so thankful that you are a God who never breaks his word. Mm -hmm. That uh, mm -hmm. you are you're so in love with us that no matter how stubborn and rebellious we can be, and God, you never change. Mm -hmm. And your desire to save us never changes with it. Mm -hmm. And because of you, we are saved and we thank you for the assurance of salvation we have in Christ Jesus. And we're also thankful that you care about us and the people we love. Uh, Lord, tonight we think of Angela and her mom and how her mom's wrestling with these phobias. And we pray, God, that you would tear down the strongholds in her mind of fear and terror. And that, God, you would set her free from these, these fears and that you would restore her to peace and tranquility in her mind. And Angela is also traveling to Jamaica. And Lord, a lot of people are going to be traveling soon, different parts of the world. Angela is asking for safe travels, and we pray that for her and, and others. Lord, we, um, and, and we pray for her and her family, her dad. I, I pray, Lord, that, um, that, you, that he would remember his daughter. Mm -hmm. and, and we, you know, I, again, appreciate Angela's love for her parents. And the love we all have or had for our parents. And then, Lord, um, there was uh, the funeral coming up uh, for Lewis Matthews and the family's grieving, of course. And, Lord, we pray that it would be a time of remembrance mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. of the gift of the life that was given. Mm -hmm. And that people would remember that, again, we gather because of the love and the love we have for you and mm -hmm. each other. And I, we pray that you would be a comfort and a strength to them during, you know, this time of loss. Yeah. And then there's this boy, he's Bruno Molina, and Lord, full heart attacks for a young man. Yeah. And Lord, there's too much of this going on. There are too many young people having heart issues. Yeah. And Lord, we pray that you'd step in and do something about it, and that you'd protect young people from, yeah. you know, the source of what's going on. And, and that, uh, Lord, in this case, praying for healing and recovery. And again, we have church members we love that, Lord, we pray for their recovering mm -hmm. and their healing. Mm -hmm. And um, restoration, Lord, to full health. Yeah. And then we um, have 
praises. Uh, we praise you for the miners that were delivered, 41 of them, Lord, like yes. now from deep down in the earth. Mm. Um, we're also praying, um, um, speaking of deliveries, we, we, Eunice was sharing that her father has pneumonia and that her and her sister have picked up COVID. So Lord, healing for the whole family. Mm -hmm. and, and, and again, a swift recovery. Mm -hmm. Lord, then we also have praises for the work that you are doing and how it is your people want to serve you. They want to make a difference. Mm -hmm. They want to reach the lost. And, and Lord, and, and, and praises for the work that's being done. Again, whether it's hamper programs or a coping with depression program or, or out feeding somebody. Lord, praising you that we have the opportunity still and the freedom mm -hmm. to go and share Jesus even through mm -hmm. our deeds. And uh, again, Lord, for what happened um, this past Sunday at the men's breakfast. Praise God. And how Amen. he moved there and how intimate that was and mm. how honest it was. And now we're praying the same thing for the women. Praying for now pouring the Holy Spirit, Lord, that you would move in and among them in a powerful way as you did the men. Mm -hmm. And Lord, as we leave now tonight, please like Stephen, please Give us boldness. Mm -hmm. Please fill us with your spirit. Mm -hmm. Please imbue us with the holiness that only comes from you. Yes. And Lord, please give us the right word mm -hmm. in the right season, yes. regardless of how other people may respond. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Lord, we love you. Thank you for tonight's study. I thank you for the all these wonderful people who've come out. God, we give you all glory. Mm -hmm. Thanking you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 <laughs> Well, good night, everybody. Good night. Thank you for coming out for our study tonight. God bless, and hopefully we'll be able to see you all next week. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Good night. Thank you.